96% of our food system is corn, soybeans, wheat, confinement, animal operations, confinement, dairy operations, etc. So like, where's the place, where does like nutritious food come from? Yeah. You know, not to say that this food doesn't have some nutrition, but I'm talking about nutritious food, not food that'll technically keep you alive. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hoda Labrata Gore. This is episode 103, and my guest is Forrest Pritchard, a full time farmer and New York Times bestselling author. If his name sounds familiar, don't worry. This isn't deja vu. We had Forrest on just a few episodes ago, and we found his perspective so refreshing and intriguing that we invited him back on the show. Forrest runs Smith Meadows Farm in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, but his vision takes him far beyond that time and place. In today's discussion, we take a hard look at farming today and farming tomorrow. What's working in sustainable farming, and what dangers threaten its future? Where are we exactly and where are we headed? You will be intrigued and enthralled by our conversation. And we'll cue it up in just a moment, but first we want to thank our sponsors. Defender Shield, protect yourself and your family from EMF radiation from cell phones, laptops, tablets, iPads, and more. Visit DefenderShield.com. And Be The Wellness, personal coaching that is training for the adventure of life. Go to BeTheWellness.com. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Forest. Hey, thanks. Nice to be here again. I love being here on your farm. It's beautiful. Yeah, we are in my little 1840s brick cottage, so welcome. Thank you. And your cat's name again? My cat's name is Luna, and she's going to be eating some kibble in the background. <laughs> I hope our listeners don't mind. I don't think they will. So I wanted to ask you, because we had a scintillating conversation last time, about where you see this slow food, regenerative agriculture kind of soulful farming movement going? Uh-huh. Well, I think there's two really foundational components to that. There's there's one, the authentic kind of no corners can be cut production aspect. I mean, it starts with the soil. It starts with the remineralization of the soil, the building of like healthy soil ecosystems, living soil from which vegetables grow or grasses in the case of my livestock operation or fruits, you know, fruits and vegetables and et cetera. Um, or it gets converted into milk, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's that, which is a very slow food process, that deep, nutritious, nourishing food. And that's the important, you know, foundation. And then there's the sales side of it. Like, how do you market that to a public that is very busy and very distracted? And, uh, you know, not everybody. The people that are focused and, you know, kind of aware and present are, I would wager, a very tiny tiny pie slice of our society. <laughs> you know, it's something that I'm still striving to be. So how, how does one navigate the desire to grow this food and produce it on one hand and yet remain profitable and make sure that it gets sold and appreciated? And so how do you see that happening even here on your own farm? To date myself, it's the $64,000 question. It's the $640,000 question, <laughs> $6.4 million question. Uh, you know, inflation, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's an, it's an incredible question because things are changing in real time. For example, at our Falls Church Farmer's Market this morning, it's a perfect fall day and sales were, were fine. But what I hear from a lot of my fellow producers is that sales are down overall, like at farmer's markets. Now, is that a question of was farming like trendy for a while? I mean, like, God forbid, you know, like yeah. farming ever be trendy, but did we ride a high, you know, an artificial high or has, you know, places like Harris Teeter and Whole Foods and, you know, Aldi and Trader Joe's all caught on? And Costco and, and Walmart. Co- exactly. And Costco and Walmart, you took the words out of my mouth. And has Blue Apron delivery service and, you know, and the five other, you know, versions of that iterations taken away market share. One wouldn't think that these things that are sacrosanct as like healthy food, that it would be, you know, a competing 
you know, pie slice, but that, that could be the case. That could be the case. So we're all the time tweaking in real time mm-hmm. to figure out, you know, like what's the effect of social media? What's the effect of getting people out to the farm? What's the effect of doing like an event that um, you attended today, which was like the making of pasta mm-hmm. in our commercial mm-hmm. kitchen, you know? And, you know, is the answer E, all the above? Like, right. ma- like maybe, maybe you don't know till you try. Right, you don't. Yeah. But I'm afraid what could happen is if a farm gets too consumed with uh, marketing and getting the word out and yeah. and upscaling, then we lose kind of what you're saying is sacrosanct, you of know, course. the heart of the matter. Yeah, yeah, it's a total balancing act, but it's also a high wire act yeah. for the farmer. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I guess it is. Yeah, and what's the safety net is like the commodity system, like you know, do you revert back to you know growing food for a mega scale? I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I have no interest in doing that. So like the onus is on me to strike that balance of, you know, making sure that the food gets honored by being eaten. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if I'm going to be raising cattle and have been perpetuate or, you know, sheep or chickens or pigs and perpetuating this circle of life, you know, I don't have any interest in, in putting it on a truck and sending it down the road to some generic slaughterhouse. You know, I want my customers to have that deep connection. But I also can't just be intransigent and show up at farmer's market even if, you know, fewer fewer people are showing up or my clientele happens to be, you know, aging, you know, on, one, on another end. You know, I don't think you need to market for marketing's sake per se, but it is, everything is sales at the end of the day. You know, whether you're growing food on a big scale or a tiny scale, uh, otherwise you're just producing food for yourself and your family and uh you can you can do that but it's hard to pay the bills right now you've got to make a living too well and so that leads me to your book growing tomorrow uh-huh. because you went around the country and visited like 18 farms in five months is that right yeah wow so what did you see how were these farmers making a living and balancing the marketing versus what they're doing on the home front and all that yeah it, it was incredible to see all the different faces and different products. And, and I want to say products, I'm talking like kumquats on a mountaintop in Temecula, California to, you know, honeybees in downtown Dallas, Texas, and wild rice being grown in a Native American reservation the size of Rhode Island in upstate Minnesota. So we're talking a pretty big spectrum, yeah. <laughs> right? And, you know, I walk into that aforementioned Red Nation tribe and their warehouse has totes full of long grain rice uh, that are bound for Israel, uh, for example. No way. Yeah, so they're sending that overseas. Red Lake Nation, sorry, I should back up and say. Okay. And, uh, and then as small a scale as, you know, like D-Town Farm in Detroit that's selling, you know, little micro greens, bags of lettuce at their local Detroit farmer's market. It's like, what's the takeaway on all that stuff? Like, everybody has the same problems, frankly. You know, it's like, there's problems with production. There's production issues with, uh, with staffing, with machinery, with, uh, with the marketing. You know, everybody's got the same problems, kind of, you know, regardless of scale. Right. And what were some of the common strong points that you saw? Uh, resiliency, spirit, determination. Uh, uh, determination not to fail. At Red Lake Nation, for example, when I, when I went out there, they said they had a tornado come through their first year, and the neighbor up there had a field of like 800 round bales, and a round bales like a thousand pounds a piece, and the tornado picked up the round bales from a half mile away and deposited them all in the middle of the rice paddies oh, up there, what? right, like right before harvest, oh. you know. So they're like trying to h- harvest rice out of a out of a mucky rice paddy in upstate Minnesota dodging round bales. Uh-huh. You know, like how, how do you plan for that contingency? No, yeah, you don't. You just simply don't. You yeah. got to roll with it, right? Yeah, pun intended. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to talk to you about D-Town Farm. I'm glad you mentioned that a moment huh? ago. Is it true that all the grocery stores like left Detroit in 2007 yeah, or that, so? That's my understanding. It, apparently, there was like six main chains of grocery stores and the last one pulled out at that point, now, I don't know if things have changed. This was 2014 when I visited there. Uh-huh. Uh, but people were shopping at convenience stores, buying like, you know, uh, Fanta, soda, and chips, and, and, and candy bars. 
was was the choice. I mean, where, wherever you'd find it, your Seven Eleven and in wherever was where people were shopping. Yeah. And so, D Town Farm, as you say, was determined to make a difference. So, what are they growing there, and are people buying it? Yeah. So their mission is is multifold. So they're a community based farm, and they got together with the city of Detroit because they didn't have land, and leased seven acres, as I recollect, from. Uh, River Rouge Park, and which is near, which is Detroit's version of Central Park in, uh-huh. in Detroit, uh, for a dollar a year, okay. And they provided community labor. They're doing compost operations and this and that. And but they've got multiple missions. So they're an education farm. Uh-huh. They've got grants to do like a. I know they got this like a like a rolling hoop house, so they can like you know roll it across the the park. Um, so they're getting some grant money. They're not fully. They're, they're probably the only farm in the book that isn't fully independent, um, but they are building towards that, you know, taking the steps towards that by selling food at the Detroit, Detroit farmers markets. And, and so people are taking advantage of it. That's my understanding. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. And so what were some of the other commonalities that you saw among these different farmers? Resiliency, like um, ability to adapt, you know. Um, I think it's really easy for uh, anyone that's not in the farming tradition to kind of superimpose what we think farming should be if it's if it's as simple as you know a red barn on the hillside with some chickens and and a horse in the silhouetted against the skyline but farming comes with problems like i alluded to earlier like the uh, you know the round bells being deposited in there uh, as foundational as uh you know the ability to have like migrant labor Uh, on the west coast in particular Mm -hmm. Uh, most of the farms i visited out there depend on human hands that are willing to show up when the crop is ready to be picked and be paid for that but also get the job done Uh you know so a lot of immigration policies greatly affect um, those farms' abilities to uh, to get that job done because there's just generational disconnects with people with you know the the idea of what people are willing to work from a physicality standpoint. And, you know, I've heard of woofing people that Uh go to volunteer on organic farms. But as you said, this is a small percentage of the population that really wants to do that. Even though those of us in these circles think, oh, everybody's into it. Not everybody's into it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And yeah, I think woofing is is a fine analogy. It's not to say that the world is absent of people willing to, you know, get their hands dirty and work hard and, and get paid like, you know, an honest reflection of what the farmer is getting compensated for. Mm. I don't think it's any stretch. I'm not being like a revisionist historian or nostalgic to say that that is a small percentage of people, right. you know. Right. Now you said all farming comes with problems and I would venture to say organic farming comes with particular problems, doesn't it? I was reading one account in your book of a man who was saying, well, he was tempted to throw in the towel because he's like, what am I supposed to do about all these bugs and pests? How do I get rid mm. of them organically, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we've got a solution for all that. It's called you know, herbicide and, and GMO, <laughs> GMO food uh, on one end, right? right. And that, that comes with its own uh, cultivation. Ironically, it's, it's one of the greatest ironies that essentially these sprays perpetuate the fostering of super weeds and super bugs, you know, because they... You know, what doesn't get killed makes it stronger, you know? Oh, yeah. Right? So there's like, you know, some headline I saw, and I'm just, I'm sidetracking a little bit off your question. Some headline I saw in the Wall Street Journal or something later, earlier this year, it was on NPR, in fact. It said the pigweed is becoming the superweed. I'm like, I got pigweed, like all the, I got pigweed out in my garden, you know, the amaranth, and I got spiny pigweed, I got smooth pigweed. I said, probably. 90% 90% of the listeners who are freaking out about hearing about pigweed probably have it like growing in their sidewalk, you know. Uh, this isn't a new thing, but what's happened is is the herbicides have, uh, you know, the plants have responded to the herbicide and what doesn't kill them has, has made them more resilient. Um, yeah, and there's no shortage of problems to be solved with organic agriculture, but we're able to employ things like, uh, like tools in our toolbox are like prevention. Uh, observation, competing species like beneficial species, um, promotion of healthy soils and healthy ecosystems that essentially are the immune system of an um, agricultural setting, and then do it, frankly, doing biomimicry, you know, figuring out what things in nature do to repel competition and predation and disease and adapting that. Oh, I love that. Huh? It, it reminds me of a conversation I had recently 
with a health professional who was saying, we want to cooperate with nature and yeah, imitate it. So mm-hmm. she was talking about supplements for the body and how doctors are, you know, passing out all these supplements. And she's like, but in nature, in our food, we get this amount of this particular iodine is what we were talking about. But you mm-hmm. know, we get a small amount of iodine. Sure. So we don't need these huge supplements to, because it doesn't, it doesn't really go with what nature offers us. Uh-huh. So I hear what you're saying. And I really like that you use the word prevention also, mm-hmm. because the idea is, Not to end up in the state where all the bugs are consuming all your plants, but to do what you can ahead of time so you're not in that pickle, so to speak. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Yeah, Yeah, you'll get in a pickle if you can't grow the cucumbers, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yes, I know exactly (laughs) what you mean. Coming up, in the second half of the program, Forrest explains why he considers farms our future and how the lack of farms and farmers is a true crisis for our nation. We pause now to thank our sponsors who help keep the show on the air. Defender Shield. Defender Shield is the worldwide leader in mobile radiation shielding. It's been tested by FCC certified labs, and Defender Shield is the first technology to block up to virtually 100% of electromagnetic radiation from laptops, tablets, and cell phones, making it the most effective shielding for mobile devices ever developed. For more information, go to DefenderShield.com and use the coupon code WISETRADITIONS10 for a 10% discount at checkout. And Be The Wellness presents BeeFest, Bee Fest is a wellness retreat with a festival vibe. It is an all-inclusive boutique festival featuring farm-to-table gourmet paleo-style meals, outdoor adventures, coaching from the masters, luxury accommodations, and nightly entertainment. Join us for four days of nourishment, connection, movement, and entertainment as we celebrate our health, nature, community, and the experience of life. Use the coupon code WISETRADITIONS for 10% off. Hey, this Bee Fest is going to be held in the Redwood Forest in California in July. I'm planning on going, and so I hope to see you there. For more information, go to bethewellness.com. That's B-E-E, thewellness.com, and use the code wise traditions for 10% off. Now, what was the most surprising thing that you found in terms of differences of techniques that your, the various farmers were using? Obviously they were growing different things, but did you see any approaches that you were like, huh, I should use that back at Smith Meadows? Yeah, I'll have to think about that. So I intentionally, because I'd written Gaining Ground and that was kind of a you know, a roundabout treatise on uh, on grass-based systems. I intentionally avoided livestock farms. There's a little, just like kind of a, a half of a livestock farm in here in in uh, Georgia. Okay. So I was really on a, on a mission to find out what fascinated me. Because if it fascinated me, I figured I could pass pass that interest through to the reader. You know, so I mostly went to places that I wanted to learn about and went in with like fresh eyes. So there was a place that actually one place I interviewed that didn't end up making going into the book for some technical reasons but they were doing pasture irrigation systems with a simplicity I'm all about simplicity I, I tell my staff easy 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 you know if it's not easy then we're doing it wrong we I mean that is to say we do hard work we do hard dirty manual labor but it needs to be easy if that <laughs> make, if that makes sense I think so okay it needs to meet our expectations. So there was a place that was doing uh, pasture irrigation in a way that I didn't know was possible, basically with souped up garden hoses and like these things called pods, which look like big dinner plates. And you could just hook them to the back of your, uh, you know, your four wheeler and drag them across the pasture and they'd bounce along like, like a pearl necklace oh. almost. And you just move them and uh, hook them to a garden hose. And they, they were developed in New Zealand and they have some bladder inside and they spray water all over the place. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. You know, I could actually see irrigating, you know, 500 acres of pasture, uh, which would otherwise be impractical uh, with Uh with drip tape. (laughs) Who was using that? Which one of your... Right. So that was a dairy outside of of, uh, Denver, Colorado, and they ended up shortly... They're a wonderful, wonderful story, but they ended up retiring unexpectedly. I think there was like some health issues or something like that. And I wanted, you know, living farms in the book. Yeah, so I was right. like, well, they retired and, you know, God bless them and Godspeed. But I didn't want somebody like sabotaging my book being like, oh, Forrest just wrote about 
this farm and they're like already out of business. Oh, oh gosh, yeah, that would <laughs> be know, bad. So. Well, and that's the thing is like, how do they stay viable? Well, obviously that couple wanted to be done. Yeah, they were older, yeah. But do you think someone took it over? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I don't think that was the case, but they um, that wasn't because it, it couldn't be the case. That was, that was their retirement destination. So, so many farms, you know, and this is what I'm working on right now, doing some writing project is, understanding the economics of farms so that new farmers can have a better understanding. So many farmers rely on the, the ultimate sale of their farm as their retirement. It is very rare for farmers to take a salary uh, mm-hmm. within their farm or do the hard, the disciplined work of uh, charging rent, which is what any business would do. You know, if one was to have an asset you know, you, you, you'd rent that. Um, but farmers rarely charge rent for themselves, much less ever take a salary. So most farmers rely upon ultimately the sale of the farm, which is kind of unique in so much that uh, when that sale occurs and they're out of a job. And out of a place to live. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that doesn't happen in other businesses. It does. It doesn't happen with stocks or bonds or CDs or rental properties or, you know, you name it. Um, and I'm sure emotionally it's difficult. Yeah, I would think that's one of the reasons why so many farms try to get passed on. I think intuitively those farmers want to see that land held not only you know, for the perpetuation of the spirit of the place, they want to stick around to see it as well. What's your next book about? So I've got a new book under contract. comes out fall 2018. It's called Start Your Farm. And that's the working title. We'll see. Gaining Ground was called Hayseeds up to the last second. So, <laughs> and Growing Tomorrow was a title that was given to me. I didn't really have a title for that book. Oh, okay. um, so, yeah, this is called uh, Start Your Farm. And, and hopefully they stick with that one because that's really what the book is about. It's, uh, so I'm co-writing it with Ellen Paul Shuck, who's a really talented vegetable farmer. I'm sure a lot of your listeners would know her. Um, and we're alternating chapters. And basically each of us came from very different backgrounds. Oh. I, of course, uh, grew up on this farm. She grew up in the suburbs and uh, bought into a partnership with uh, Potomac Vegetable Farms. It's based in Tyson's Corner, more or less. And uh, we have each had, uh, you know, probably combined a hundred interns and apprentices along oh, the way. Wow. So we've both taught uh, the economics of farming, the hands-on activity of farming, the hard realities of farming. And we felt like while there were many dozens and dozens and dozens of excellent books about how to do, like a how, how to, you know, do raised beds, how to do a small-scale farm, how to do, you know, an orchard or a dairy or this or that, there wasn't a comprehensive kind of like Rosetta Stone of here's the mindset, here are the vague, important philosophical ideas and concepts Mm -hmm. that one must be aware of and start training your mind uh, for the really challenging realities. And like we base it all on practical examples, but it's it's basically a, a treatise that's intended to be like a really engaging read. Because without that, people were getting into the field, no pun intended, right. without their eyes wide open, kind uh-huh. of. Uh-huh. And yeah. just learning on the go and realizing like, oh my gosh, I never thought about this economic consequence. Of course. So that's one of the big tenets that we talk about is get how to gain experience without financially shackling yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that, if you do it both simultaneously, that is a recipe for one center block around one foot and one center block around the other as you're trying to learn how to swim, we wow. think. Yeah. Yeah. And not, not the least of which is land isn't valued for farming. Land is valued for what kind of house one can put on it. That's true. Okay. So, and that's within any proximity to any kind of major consumer audience or, you know, consumer population, it's going to be valued for what house you can put on it. And if you're farther into the country, it will be valued for what kind of crop output you can get off the land and that's a whole different you know breed of cat out there because the that is a commodity subsidy based system and uh, when land comes available often you don't even know it comes it becomes available because it's all just uh, handshake deals oh yeah so you don't even know yeah it's just the guy down the street exactly they've the woman of the town yeah well they've just negotiated like behind closed doors kind of thing 
because land is is such a I mean it's a it's a literal commodity for commodities uh-huh. out there. Uh, and again, I'm not like saying like uh, that's that's like bad or whatever. That's just the way it is. Right. Yeah. So. So, for us, how many people do you think? Not that you can know the number off the top of your head, but are really going to go for it and start these farms? I think I read in your book that like. Two percent of the population yeah. is directly responsible for growing our food in the U.S. Yeah, is that a low number? It sounds kind of low to me. <laughs> well, it's all relative. I mean, indus- mechanization, industrialization has pushed a lot of that along, but the consequences are it's like one point eight percent. Okay, like less than two are are growing food and or like first stage involved in the picking and processing of food. You know, if you take like everybody that's involved in like food production, it, it jumps up to around like eight or 10%, but a lot of that has to do with like the processing distribution and warehousing and stuff like that. Um, so you have that on one end, but like 96% of our food system is corn, soybeans, wheat, confinement, animal operations, confinement, uh, dairy operations, etc. Where's the place? Where does like nutritious food come from? Yeah. You know, not to say that this food doesn't have some nutrition, but I'm talking about nutritious food, <laughs> not food that'll like technically keep you alive, right? Uh, food that won't give you type two diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, where's that going to come? I don't know. But like, I won't wake up one day and say like I didn't do my part in trying to make sure that that didn't come to fruition. Um, I think it's an ethical, uh, it's an ethical mission. Uh, it's like our next crisis. I mean, it's a real crisis. I mean, they're talking about like a you know, nuclear war with North Korea or whatever, and people tweeting back and forth. I'm talking about, like, us not having anything but, like, you know, chicken sandwiches and, 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 and high fructose corn syrup to eat because all the farmers are aging out. They're 59, 60 years old. Yeah. You know, so if this, a book like this and other books and other programs and sustainable agriculture degree programs and government subsidies, you know, the $25 billion dollars, of government subsidies that go towards the perpetuation of corn, soybeans, and you know all these big monoculture crops, if that doesn't start to become a 50-50 ball game uh, with sustainable agriculture and regenerative soil building and nutritious food production, then we're all in trouble. So call your congressman. <laughs> I live in D.C. Right. I don't have representation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Eleanor Holmes Norton, right? Yeah, it's a shadow. It's called the, She's called a shadow representative. Yeah, it's exactly. not very encouraging. But I, our listeners can definitely do that because not only that, what I like about your Growing Tomorrow book is not only do you highlight these farms, but you give recipes. Uh-huh. So I feel like all of us need to take steps closer to the land. If we're not going to start our farm, Mm -hmm. at least we can start getting that nutritious food you were describing and Mm -hmm. making some of it ourselves with the products from the local farmers market or our local farmers. So they're all steps we can take. So I am inspired, even if I'm not represented, (laughs) but I'm, I'm very grateful for this conversation. And I do hope that we all can take steps to have a better tomorrow, because like you said, Three times a day, this is something we've got to be thinking about. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and if we don't think about it and, and be proactive about it, it, it will not take care of itself. So that is my that is my call to action for everyone. Excellent. Well, I always have this question I ask at the end, and maybe you've already answered it. So if the listener could only do one thing to improve their health, Forrest, what would you recommend that they do? Yeah, bu- like building off of like the idea off, off the last podcast where I mentioned actually growing something tangibly, uh, getting your hands in the soil, uh, experiencing, you know, growing of life and the, and the failure of like having something that didn't work, understanding, you know, the intentionality that has to go into growing food. The other thing is, is going to be the answer for the next, the next 50 years is to foster and instill that fascination in a young person. Uh, whether it's a, a granddaughter or a niece or a nephew, to get young people involved in that production and to translate that onto, onto the table where it just tastes good. Yeah, so. that's one great way to grow tomorrow. So thank you for your time today. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks again. My guest today was Forrest Pritchard. For more information on Forrest, go to smithmeadows.com. Or just go to the westonaprice.org website, click on the tab for blogs and podcasts, and go to the podcast page and look for the show notes for this episode, number 103. Also, a big thank you to Podcast Village. Charlie Burney is my friend. 
and the head honcho there. Sarah Fernandez is my editor, and they are pros when it comes to training, producing, and promoting podcasts. Check them out at podcastvillage.com. And I want to thank all of my interns, Cynthia Castro Cohen Enriquez, Joy de los Santos, and Lily Hampt for their help with the show notes and many other details that help pull the show off. Hey, and I just want to let you guys know if you're listening this very week, it's time for the Wise Traditions Conference. You can actually be a part of it all by signing up for the live streaming. It's very affordable, and you will get to listen to speakers like those that we feature as guests on this show. So check it out. Just go to wisetraditions.com and find out how you can be a part of it all. And so you will enjoy it virtually just as you enjoy these shows. And thanks for listening, guys. Did you know that there are Weston A. Price Foundation chapters all over the U.S. and around the world? Chapter leaders help you find good food in your area, and some have meetings you can attend. Go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on Find a Local Chapter to see if there is one near you. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming in the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.